ask an M. Night Shyamalan fan what their favorite of his catalog is, get the requisite last airbender joke out of the way, and you'll probably either hear about a kid that can see dead people or Unbreakable, Shyamalan's deconstruction of superhero stories. It's a wonderful film, and wonderfully complemented by its surprise sequel, 2017's Split. So before Glass, the third film in the trilogy comes out, slap those ponchos on, practice those wall crawls, let's get you caught up on the story of Unbreakable and Split in nine minutes. David Dunn, a security guard at a football stadium, is on a train home to Philadelphia after a job interview. The train derails, and David wakes up in a hospital. That's when a doctor that looks suspiciously like Doug Stamper from House of Cards tells him that not only was he the crash's sole survivor, but that he made it out without injury. Well, other than the bruised ego that he got from getting shut down by a married woman. David attends the memorial service of the train passengers, and when he returns to his car, he discovers a note pinned under his wiper. The note asks David how many times in his life he's been sick, a query that perplexes him a lot more than it should any normal person. David tracks the note to a comic book art gallery run by Elijah Price, who suffers from brittle bone disease. Elijah is a dedicated lover of superheroes, and has believed his entire life that the kinds of people those superhero stories are about walk among us. Their power is exaggerated in fiction, but nevertheless real. Elijah tries to convince David that by being the sole survivor of the crash and never having been sick, he's likely one of the metahumans that he's always wanted to meet. Joseph, don't take another sip of that water. Of course, this all sounds crazy, so David and his son Joseph leave. Elijah visits David at work as he's overseeing a line of people shuffling into the stadium. David brushes up against a man in line and somehow intuits that he has a silver gun with a black handle tucked into his jeans. David starts having his guards pat people down and the man steps out of line, seemingly confirming that he does have a weapon. But to be sure, Elijah pursues him into a subway station. On the way in, he trips and falls down the stairs, shattering 14 bones, but also getting a glimpse of a silver gun with a black handle tucked into the man's belt. Sure is looking like David Dunn's got superpowers. Back at David's house, he and Joseph test out Elijah's theory with a little bench press sesh. At first, David tells Joseph to keep the weights relatively low, but the boys quickly discover that David can bench almost 350 pounds with ease. Sure is looking like David Dunn's got superpowers. Yeah, we know it, and so does Joseph, who basically starts trying out to be David's sidekick, but he realizes after a schoolyard fight that it's probably just Pops with the powers. David arrives at the school after the fight to talk with Joseph's teacher, who it turns out was also David's teacher back in the day. She recounts the time that David nearly drowned in the school pool, a memory David had suppressed. David believes this to be the fatal weakness in Elijah's theory, but Elijah believes the exact opposite. After all, what superhero doesn't have a super weakness? Eventually, David relents and admits that he may indeed have superpowers. Elijah suggests that he test himself by going into public and using his ability to sense the evil deeds of others to do some good. He encounters a janitor who has murdered a man and is currently holding his family prisoner at their home. David follows the man back and frees the children, but is attacked by the janitor as he attempts to save their mother. David is pushed into the pool below and nearly drowns, but the kids manage to get him out. Yay, kids. He rushes back upstairs and chokes the janitor to death. David meets with Elijah the next day, both now finally on the same page about David's abilities. That's when Elijah finally makes physical contact with David for the first time, revealing that he perpetrated three terrorist attacks, including David's train derailment, in order to flush out a real-life superhero, realizing and quickly accepting that he is David's arch-villain. Man, he needs a catchy name, though. They call me Mr. Glass. Hmm. They called me Mr. Glass. All right, dude, we get it. They called you Mr. Glass. We will call you Mr. Glass. David tips off the authorities, and Mr. Glass is sent to an institution for the criminally insane. So now we've got one villain for David, eh, may as well give him another. And that is where Split comes in. Split picks up with Casey, a reclusive teenager, getting a ride home with classmates Claire and Marsha from Claire's birthday party, which she got guilt invited to. Once the girls are in the car, a man knocks out Claire's dad and chloroforms the girls, bringing them to a prison cell built into some kind of basement. The girls wake up and quickly discover that they are not dealing with a run-of-the-mill kidnapper. While it was a stern man with perverted tendencies named Dennis, not that one, that brought them into their cell, it's a matronly woman named Patricia who comes back to check on them. That's right, this kidnapper has a split personality disorder. And it's not just Dennis and Patricia. There are 23 personalities, all fighting for control of the same person, Kevin. 
Barry, one of Kevin's alters, visits Dr. Fletcher, his longtime psychologist. Like Mr. Glass, Dr. Fletcher believes in the existence of metahumans and that some people with disorders like Kevin's may actually be metahuman themselves. Despite having asked for an emergency session the night prior, Barry insists that things are fine, which of course they aren't. Casey, Claire, and Marsha wake up to find Hedwig, a nine-year-old altar of Kevin's, sitting in the door. I have red socks. Hedwig is the kindest natured of Kevin's altars and politely informs the girls that something is coming to eviscerate them. Nice kid. I have blue socks too. Something Hedwig says tips the girls off to the fact that their cell may not be as secure as they had suspected. They find a grate in the ceiling and Claire manages to escape the room, but Dennis catches her and locks her up by herself. Later on in the basement, Patricia makes a sandwich for Casey and Marsha. Marsha attacks Patricia and makes a break for it, but she doesn't get very far. Before locking her in a room of her own, Patricia tells Marsha that the girls have been chosen because they have never experienced pain or trauma in their lives, but they're about to. Following another panicked email, Barry visits Dr. Fletcher again. But at this point, Dr. Fletcher is too familiar with Kevin's personalities to be tricked, because it's actually the devious Dennis persona in control, not Barry. Dr. Fletcher mentions that Dennis and Patricia were banned from the light for their fanatical belief in a superpowered 24th altar of Kevin's, the Beast. Casey starts to form a bond with Hedwig, who she believes could be her only way out. He tells her that he's the only altar with the ability to take the light as the presiding personality whenever he wants, which is why Dennis and Patricia are using him, to keep the other altars at bay as they await the arrival of the Beast. Casey knows that once the Beast shows up, it's game over. So later, she convinces Hedwig to bring her to his room, where she hopes to escape through a window that he's mentioned. Unfortunately, that window is just a dinky drawing, but after being treated to some of Hedwig's sick dance moves, Casey gets Hedwig to show her his walkie-talkie, which she steals away from him and unsuccessfully uses to call for help before Patricia takes the light back and locks Casey back up. After receiving a flurry of emails from the altars, Dr. Fletcher finally visits Dennis, who brings her into his kitchen to talk. And surprise, that was a silly move. Dr. Fletcher finds Claire in a locked room just before Dennis knocks her out. With everything uh, under control, Dennis leaves, heading to the place where he and Patricia believe they can bring forth the beast, an empty train car. And bring forth the beast, they do. The beast returns, just as Dr. Fletcher finishes scribbling something on a piece of paper. He gives her one hell of a fatality before moving on to make a meal out of Marsha and Claire. Yeah, literally. Meanwhile, Casey is able to escape her room and finds video diaries for all 23 of Kevin's personalities. In one of them, she notices a set of keys on the wall, which she takes, moving on to get Marsha and Claire. Casey gets to the girls too late, but manages to lock the beast up. But of course, deadbolts are no match for the beast. He escapes and goes after Casey, who has just found Dr. Fletcher's note. It seems that the beast's weakness is hearing his true full name. Kevin from. Casey says the name aloud, and Kevin takes the light for the first time in nearly three years. He implores Casey to get his shotgun and kill him. She grabs the weapon, but the beast takes the light back, attacks, and chases her into a cell. Despite being shot twice at close range, the beast pulls the cell bars apart. But as he's going in for the kill, he notices that Casey has a number of scars from self-harm. The beast, who values pain and suffering as purity, deems her worthy of life and leaves her alone. In a diner, a news report recounts Casey's ordeal with Kevin, dubbing him and his many personalities the Horde. A woman in the diner notes that this reminds her of another criminal with a catchy nickname. What was his name again? They called me Mr. Glass. Yeah, we remember. And so does David Dunn, who realizes immediately that he may have a new supervillain to battle. And that's what Glass is all about. David will attempt to hunt down the beast, but Elijah is going to do what he does best. Be sinister and probably manipulate the heck out of both of them. Thanks for watching. For more on Glass, be sure to check out our review, and as always, be sure to follow and subscribe wherever you like to watch IGN.